Hello, yeah, Roman. This video is going to be in three parts ish. It's going to give you some historical context, some deep rooted historical context as to what is going on in the Middle East. I'm going to give you the why and the what. And then I'm going to give you a possible outcome after what is going on currently, today, in the Middle East. Were you aware that there's been a secret international meeting in Geneva to discuss post-Hamas scenarios? Post-Hamas scenarios. The meeting aimed to discuss the post-Hamas situation and involved the partition of the Palestinian Authority, some European countries and an American delegation. Now, to me, this confirms three things. One, Hamas is over. Done. Finished. Hezbollah will not join the war. And three, Iran will not escalate. Now, what happens post Hamas will have immense generational impact for both the Gazans and the Israelis. And that's from a Middle Eastern news source, Channel 11. Also, this current theatre in the Middle East is unique in that it's the first ever space war. Now, how can I legitimately say that? Israel shot down a ballistic missile that was travelling 62 miles above Earth. The Israeli Defence Force, that's the IDF, revealed last week that its Arrow missile defence system took down an aerial threat. Allegedly, fired by Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. Now, whilst details are quite sparse, the accepted boundary between Earth's atmosphere and space is 62 miles above the surface. It's known as the von Kármán line, or just the Kármán line. The IDF said the Arrow intercepted a surface-to-surface sur -surface missile in the Red Sea, fired towards its territory after the rocket travelled nearly 1,000 miles from Yemen. Space wars. So let me give you some further context and some people are speculating as to what m the current theatre is all about. Well, it looks like the Arab nations no longer have a negotiation point. Did you notice that America sent one of its nuclear submarines to the eastern Mediterranean a few days ago? Is that sufficient deterrent? Some sabre rattling from various Arab countries, but the minute that America put a nuclear submarine with nuclear warheads on it in the East Mediterranean, suddenly everybody got an understanding. But also, I'm sure you're not aware, that there are two gas fields under the Gaza Strip. Gaza Marine 1 and Gaza Marine 2. They were found in 1999, nearly 25 years ago. In 2000, the Palestinian Authority, that was one of the organisations that participated in this secret meeting in Geneva, they requested British Gas explore what they thought was under the Gaza Strip. And British Gas identified a 30 billion cubic metre of gas reserves under the Gaza Strip. British Gas and the Palestinian Authority. Now, Israel's latest data reveals a 750 billion cubic metre of proven gas reserves and 50 billion barrels of oil. So whomever owns those fields is going to be a very cash-rich society. Won't be the Gazans. Could it be Israel? Now, to give you some context, Gaza Marine 1, Gaza Marine 2, there's definite gas deposits and there's 50 billion barrels of oil. At today's price, times 50 billion, times $82. A lot of money. Now, the Hamas leaders, do you think they're in Gaza? No, they don't live in Gaza. 
their remote and telling the Hamas fighters what to do. Now, where would they be living? In Israel or Egypt? No. Hamas leaders live in luxury in Qatar. Now, these Hamas leaders that live in Qatar are worth, conservatively, collectively, $11 billion. And yet the Gazans can't even have fresh water or food. And yet the Hamas leaders are in Qatar living in luxury with, that some speculate, a collective wealth of $11 billion. Is that being reported anywhere? So what do you think uh, the outcome is going to be? Currently, Israel is at war, by their own words, with Hamas. But there is something that has been mooted since 1960. And this could be a possible outcome. The Ben-Gurion Canal. Who's Ben-Gurion? Well, he's, some say, the founding father of Israel. The first Prime Minister of Israel. They have the Ben-Gurion Airport in Israel. Revered. But what is the Ben-Gurion Canal? Well, it aims to connect the Red Sea with the Mediterranean Sea. And I know you might say, hang on a second, Adrian, we've already got the Suez Canal. Yeah, I realise that. Suez Canal was opened in 1869. And the Suez Canal Company was given a 99-year lease, which was up in 1967. Now, who owned the Suez Canal Company? Well, fan my brow, it was the British and the French. Britain purchased Egypt's share of the Suez Canal Company, which was about 44%, in 1875. The French remained the majority shareholders. And can you remember that after the October 7th attack, the Americans were in first, then the Brits, Rishi Sunak, and then the French, President Macron. So why would those three be first in? Any deals going on? Now, in 1888, there was a convention between Great Britain and Germany, Austria-Hungary, Spain, France, Italy, Netherlands, Russia and Turkey. This is Victorian era. And what this convention was that was agreed, it was the Convention of Constantinople, October 29th, 1888. It was to respect the free navigation of the Suez Canal. This Convention of Constantinople stated every single nation could use the canal, whether at war or peace. And nations could not be denied access. Fast forward to 1949. Not long after the Second World War. Egypt denied Israel access after the Nakba. May 1948. Nakba could be translated into a disaster or catastrophe. Basically, the displacement of the Palestinian Arabs, as they were then called. That was 1949. So, you know, 70 years ago, 70 odd years ago. Now, the president of Egypt in 1956 decided to nationalise the Suez Canal. Remember, the French and the British had owned it. And it was the, its 99 year lease was... Uh, was what, nine years away? So 90 years after the original lease was uh, agreed, the president of Egypt nationalised the Suez Canal, taking it away from the British and the French. But this is where it gets slightly complex. America reneged on an agreement to finance the Aswan Dam. This is in 1956. Now, the Aswan Dam was to benefit the Egyptian people. I've been there. I've seen the dam. I've visited Egypt, which is a breathtakingly beautiful country with an immense history. But Egypt had asked America for $270 million to build the Aswan High Dam. And America withdrew the funding, followed by the UK and the World Bank. Can you see how GB UK has its sticky little fingers in lots of different pies? In 1958, two years later, Russia provided the required funds. And in 1960, there was the construction of the Aswan High Dam. It began in 1960. And then 
1967, there was the Arab-Israeli War. So you can see it's deep-rooted. What goes on in the Middle East is deep-rooted and historical. It goes back hundreds of years, generation after generation after generation. But let's fast forward to 1978, when the world called Jimmy Carter one of America's worst presidents. Jimmy Carter. Have you heard of the Camp David Peace Accord? It was President Jimmy Carter, American president, Egypt's President Anwar Sanat, and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. And these men were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1978 for that very Camp David Peace Accord. Now, part of the deal was that Egyptians' president wanted the Israeli-occupied Sinai Peninsula returned to Egypt. The Camp David summit lasted about 13 days in September 1978, August, September 78. Now, let's fast forward it to 2023. This year, in July, it came out, and I don't know how, whether it was freedom of information or whether it was because it was over 50 years old, but America had a plan in the 1960s to blast an alternative Suez Canal through Israel using 520 small nuclear bombs through the Negev Desert Hills. Now, I've been to the Negev Desert and those Negev Desert Hills. I've been to Jordan, I've been to Israel many times. And the Negev Desert is a tough, desolate place. So why? Why would they want to bomb the Negev Desert Hills with 520 small nuclear bombs? Again, let me give you some context. If you take the shipping traffic from sort of the Far East over to Europe, because Europe is a very big market. If you don't go through the Suez Canal, you've got to go down round Africa and up the west of Africa into the Mediterranean to Europe. The Suez Canal has 10 to 15 percent of world trade go through it. More importantly, 10 percent of the global oil distribution. Now, remember what I said to you about Gaza Strip, 50 billion barrels of oil. So how would they get that out of the Gaza Strip and then through to Europe? That massive European market, or even Africa for that matter. Would it go through the Suez Canal? Remember, Egypt blocked Israel. Egypt in 2022. Let me tell you how much money Egypt is making from the Suez Canal. In 2022, Egypt made $9.4 billion profit from the Suez Canal. They're making $15 million a day from the Suez Canal. In 2021, over 20,000 vessels flowed through the Suez Canal, and that was up 10% from 2020. Now, I know this may seem like I'm throwing lots of figures at you, but you have to realise that this is all about the Benjamins, the Greenbacks, the Moolah. So in, up to 2014, the Suez Canal was the main thoroughfare from the kind of bottom of the Red Sea through to the Mediterranean. So you would get lots of oil flowing through there, military flowing through there. And some of the Arab nations wouldn't want the Western nations, like Israel and America, to have their military flow through the Suez Canal. And it, up to 2014, it was, so if you imagine it's sort of northwest to southeast, the Suez Canal. So it would only go one way for six hours, and then the next six hours, the other way. Because you couldn't have two ships side by side in the Suez Canal, or parts of the Suez Canal. So it, it had to flow one way and then the other. It's not wide enough for some of the big super tankers that float around the oceans nowadays. And can you remember in 2021, that mega ship, as they call it, ever given, it got stuck. Now, that ship getting stuck, and it, <laughs> it was a proper catastrophe. It caused, estimated, at 900 
million dollars worth of losses worldwide. Just one ship getting stuck, estimated $900 million worth of losses. And Egypt can also restrict the movement of military ships too. Now, the Ben Gurion Canal is going to be 50 metres deep, which is 10 metres more than the Suez Canal. It's going to be wider than the Suez Canal. These are all proposed plans, of course, but it's going to be wider than the Suez Canal so that two mega ships can get through the Ben Gurion Canal. And they estimate that the profit, the yearly profit from the Ben Gurion Canal would be at least six billion dollars. So already you've got Israel six billion a year plus up for having a canal and also the gas and oil reserves. But also the Suez Canal is, is built on sand. So technically engineers will tell you that that is uh, it's not great. Yet the Ben Gurion Canal will be through rock stable perfect for any canal so the gaza strip gets in the way of all of this if you look at the mapping the proposed uh, direction of the ben gurion canal from the red sea from elat it's kind of swerving away from the gaza strip but it would be very convenient if israel controlled the gaza strip and had the ben gurion canal flow through there because what would happen is that the Ben Gurion Canal going through the Gaza Strip would help the Gazans economy. It would also mean that the construction money would flow into and I believe what's happening today there's news coming out of Israel that uh, the Israeli authorities have said that they are going to ceasefire four hours every day so that the Gazans can get out of the Gaza Strip and here's what I think will happen now as I say many times one what's the first casualty of war the truth two if I was psychic I'd be winning the lottery every weekend and I'm not this is just taking all the facts as I have them today at my disposal and this is what I think will happen they've They've got the Gazans out of uh, the North Gazan Strip. The Gazans in the West Bank will be subsumed into Jordan. The Gazans in the south of the Gazan Strip will be guided to go to the Sinai Peninsula. And there will be a new settlement of Gazans on the Sinai Peninsula. And all of the construction... The Americans and the Israelis and other international forces will come into the Sinai Peninsula and build a new home for the Gazans. And there will be a buffer each side so that there's a buffer between Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula and the Gazans. And there will be a buffer zone between the Gazans on the Sinai Peninsula and Israel and the Gaza Strip. Gazans will go out of the West Bank into Jordan so then Israel has all of that land and surely that would be the best outcome for everyone to bring peace and prosperity to the Middle East Israel becomes richer because if you look at the GDP what a few dates gross domestic product of Israel tourism and dates but if it's gas and oil and they have a canal that's making them could be tens of billions of dollars profit per year. 50 billion barrels of oil under the Gaza Strip. And the strategy for the Israelis, they've said this. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu has said this in some of his uh, press conferences. The strategy is that this will never happen again. So there's my thoughts. There's my take. There's the facts and the figures. You can go and do your own research. Look at the Wikipedia page, Ben Gurion Canal. It's all there in, in plain sight. Who knows what the outcome is going to be? Because this was a terrorist attack that Israel is responding to. 
but surely a new home for the Gazans and prosperity for the Gazans in the Sinai Peninsula would make much sense. And peace and prosperity brought to the Middle East, it's not going to escalate. Hezbollah is not going to attack Israel. Iran doesn't want to escalate. And there's already been a secretive Geneva meeting where certain people, including the Palestinian Authority, are looking at what is going to happen after the Hamas scenario. Let's hope calm heads can prevail. My name's Adrian Allen. Thank you for your likes, your subscriptions, but most of all your indulgence, and I shall see you in the next video.